Morning, church family. Morning. Happy Sabbath and special welcome. Special welcome to our guests, and visitors, and those who join us on the internet, and everyone who is here this morning. It is my prayer and desire that the Lord Himself would be present here in our midst by His Holy Spirit. And that after being here, we would know that we have been with the Lord. I pray that He touches each and every heart in a very, very special way. Because He knows your name. He knows exactly where you are in your journey. And He knows what you need to hear from Him this morning. And this is my prayer, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would reach your heart this morning, and you will never be the same again. We had a memorial service for Howard Fleming yesterday. We miss him. He's resting in Jesus. What a great individual and a friend he was. I was hesitating if I should tell you this or not, but God is leading me to the point where I need to share this with you. About five Sabbaths ago, as I was standing in the back, Howard came to me. Because he was attending here quite often. And he said, Pastor, this is the last time. I said, Howard, are you kidding me? What, what do you mean? He says, there is always a last time. And this is it. I'm like, Howard, you're, this is one of your jokes. <laughs> you know, this, this can't be true because you're, you're just visiting and joking. And, and, uh, but he says, yeah, this time is true. I can't explain it. So as he left, I thought to myself, can't be true, but at the same time I thought, hmm, it can. Our lives are very fragile. This is why I take every time that I have an opportunity to share Christ, I take it with a lot of prayer and humility, praying that God would give me a tenderness and love to deliver the gospel because I always know there is someone in congregation that may be hearing it for the first time. At the same time, the reality is there may be someone who's hearing it for the last time. We never know. That's why I was hesitant if I should share it or not. But that's the reality of life, and that's exactly what happened. That's why I pray, Lord, help me to preach the gospel in such a way that it would change us forever because there is nothing more important than, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. This last week I had the privilege to travel to um, Silver Spring, Maryland, where we have our world headquarters for the Adventist Church. It was my first time visiting there. I was impressed and touched by the spirit and atmosphere and what I saw in the world headquarters for the Adventist Church. Because I saw this panorama of pictures in the, in the lobby where, where you come in, and, and the title is Eden to Eden. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I'm preaching on Eden right now. So isn't that wonderful? And the whole panorama of pictures shows that Christ is the one that will bring his children like you and me home. Eden lost and Eden restored. The second coming of Jesus, that blessed hope is still a blessed hope for God's people. And we are still looking up. We are still people looking up. To the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the theme of the worldwide headquarters of our church, and I thought, wow, isn't that the truth? We don't have any other message. 
The message is Jesus, a Savior and a soon-coming King. And I was there for the meetings that had to do with, uh, with the media ministries. Um, and you know, when, when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, Pharisees told him, Tell your disciples to be quiet. They're too happy. They're too excited about your uh, uh, triumphant entry. Triumphal entry. And what did Jesus say to them? If they be quiet, the rocks will cry out. Do you know, if you have a device like this, do you know that your screen is actually made from rocks? So the media ministry that reaches to the devices of every, every person around the world today is basically a fulfillment of the words of Jesus. The rocks, the screens, are crying out. <laughs> now, what is this gospel? Is it worth sharing? What is this message of the gospel? I'll keep it. On the pulpit so I can, I can watch the clock. Now, there is a clock also in the back. Why is this message is so important? Why is it so important that even rocks will cry out to share the message of the gospel throughout the world? There is a movie about this man. It's called Less Miserables. Maybe some of you watched it. It's, a, it's kind of a musical Jean Valjean is a prisoner number 24604, sentenced to 10 years of prison just for stealing a loaf of bread from, a local drug, uh, from the local store. So he is given 10 years for the loaf of bread in prison, and then he's given nine more years for the attempt to run away. So he, was, he spent 19, spends 19 years in prison for that Offense. Welcome to the world, real world of injustice. And this poor man with a heart of gold is released now, but he has to wear a yellow tag that basically guarantees him life of unemployment and outcast for the rest of his life. He's never given a second chance. He is treated as damaged goods who are still a threat to their community. Now, as the story goes on, the kind and generous priest welcomes Jean, Val Jean, to his home and provides shelter and food. But then the first night that he spends at the priest's home, he gets up. He goes to the kitchen but not to look for food. He goes through cupboards and, and shelves and, and he finds a church silverware. He grabs the bag, he fills the bag with that silverware and he steals expensive silverware and he runs in a lonely street in the night and he tries to find the place where he would go with this silverware that he just stole from the people that gave him shelter and food and everything. And of course, police seize him, and they arrest him, and they bring him back to the priest's home, and they tell the priest, hey, look, we got the robber. He stole your silverware, and we, we, we got him, and we brought him to you, and the justice needs to be now done to him. And the priest says, he didn't steal it from me. I gave it to him. And Jean is amazed at the generosity of this priest who says, no, I gave it to him. He didn't steal anything from me. So police is, is disarmed. They don't know what to do. They leave. And Jean is overwhelmed. Who is this priest? The 
priest is the first person in his life who gave him the second chance. He begins to think that this world can be a place that you can trust someone. You know, the Einstein, he asked the question, the main question of life is, is the universe friendly? Jean Baljean, he finds hope in the forgiveness and grace that is offered to him. He gets his new identity and a new name. He moves to the big city. He begins to work for the big factory. He becomes the owner of the factory, and eventually he becomes the mayor of the city. The tremendous story of the change. As I, as I watch the story of, of this gentleman in, 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 the, in the movie, I thought, wow. Isn't that the illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Isn't God the God who gives you and me a second chance when we don't deserve it? Isn't that exactly how God is treating you and me? That's why the gospel is worth sharing. Because it's the only power to give you and me a new life. So the final question is not like, is the universe friendly? Is there a God that is friendly and loving and forgiving and the God of the second chance for you and me? And as we study the scripture, we have discovered in our series of studies, Eden Restored, that God is loving and forgiving. Yes, we are still dealing in, in the world of sin, but Bible has a good news for you, and I invite you to open Revelation 20 and verses 1 through 5, where it says in the Bible that there will come a day when the one who is making, trying to make your and my life miserable, the one who created all, the, all kinds of distortions and evil in this world, he will be put to stop. His activities of evil and sufferings, and all of those things that the enemy is trying to do in this world will end one day. And that's the good news of the gospel. Because God is the God who is going to save his children and make universe a new place again. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 5. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him, Bible says, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their heads. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is first resurrection. When Jesus comes a second time, like he promised he would, there will be only four kinds of people. That's all. How many kinds of people did they say there will be? Four kinds of people. What do I mean by that? There will be righteous living. There will be righteous sleeping. <laughs> Resting. There will be wicked living and there will be wicked resting and sleeping. Four kinds of people. So what happens when Jesus comes? Now, remember, only four kinds of people. When Jesus comes the second time, he will not be concerned whether people are rich or poor. He will not be concerned whether people are educated or uneducated, whether they are Democrats or Republicans. He won't be concerned about that. 
There will be only four kinds of people. There will be only those who have committed their lives to Christ, fully surrendered to him, accepted the gospel of Jesus, and those who have rejected and rebelled against Jesus and chose to stand on the side of the enemy. That's sad reality, but that's what the Bible teaches us about. So what happens when Jesus comes? Go with me to John 14, 3. It says, Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there may, there you, and that word you, I pray that none of us, none of us, my friends, would be missing in that number. That's my prayer. Jesus has you on his mind. He went to heaven to prepare a place for you. That's what he says. And then we read in Thessalonians, it says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. It's not a secret event. It's not a quiet event. There is a lot of noise happening at the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen to that. Amen. What a hope. What an assurance to those who have committed their lives to Christ. At the second coming of Jesus, those who are sleeping in their graves, they are resurrected. Resurrected? Those who are in Christ, righteous sleeping. What about righteous living? Together with them, they are caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To be with the Lord. What happens to, the, to those who are still in this world, going about their own business, rejecting Christ and choosing the side of the enemy? The Bible says that at that time, the brightness of His coming will be consuming. Who are alive? Then we who are alive shall... And remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the righteous are taken to heaven with Jesus Christ. But this world becomes a desolate place. One thousand years is a period of time that the Bible is talking about between first resurrection and the second resurrection. Which resurrection do you want to be a part of? The first resurrection. That's when Jesus comes. Those who have committed their lives to Jesus will come up in the first resurrection. The earth is desolate. 1,000 years in the Bible is not the 1,000 of years of prosperity. Like some, some people think that our world is getting better and eventually we'll slide into 1,000 years of golden prosperity. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible says that there, Jesus will come at midnight. It will be a dark time for the history of this world. It will not be a better time. But Jesus will come and he will take his own. But the earth will be desolate. And it says that the enemy will be placed in abyss or bottomless pit. I used to think it's such a deep hole with no bottom. But according to, to the scripture, the word abyss means chaos. Basically, the world is going to be a complete disaster. And the enemy who wanted to be God, who said, I will get up higher than God, I will be sitting on the throne, I will be like the Almighty One, I will be like God. He will be by himself at the forced vacation for a thousand years on a desolate planet, and you know that he is not a creator. He, he can distort and ruin what God creates. But he cannot produce anything. He cannot recreate this world. And as Pastor C.D. Brooks used to say, he can't create even a flashlight. <laughs> In a dark place, <laughs> he can't create even a flashlight for himself. That's the condition of this world, according to the Bible, during the thousand years. But the scripture says that the redeemed ones will be reigning with Christ in heaven for a thousand years. They will be there with Christ 
their questions will be answered. The books will be opened to them because the Bible says that the judgment is given to them, meaning they'll be provided all the information. There is nothing that God does under the table, and it doesn't say it's not your business. God never does that. He'll open up everything. And all the questions will be answered. I pray that you and I will be there, that we do not neglect the opportunity. And I, I'm still wondering, and I believe you still wondering, <laughs> how is it possible for me, a broken person, to be there? What needs to be recorded in those books? Do I need to do more things to be there? What would it take to be in that number? What is the gospel that is worth sharing? Go with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 48. This is the familiar story of, of Joseph who is in Egypt, and he is, uh, he is of, a, of a high... Um, high position in the land of Egypt. And Jacob, his father, is getting old. And they told him that he is getting really weak. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, we read interesting insight into this story because Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, could have the highest order of priesthood in Egypt. Because of their mom. That's what patriarchs and prophets say. They could get the best positions in Egypt that was most developed country in the world at that time. But Joseph chooses to bring them to his dad for a special blessing. Because he believes that heavenly blessing, God's blessing, is more important than the position in this world. He believes that they want to have inheritance with God's people. And that's why he brings his two sons to Jacob. Verse 10 says, Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near to him and embraced them and kissed them. He understands that the biggest thing they want to have, the, the, the greatest thing they want to have in their life would be the blessing that comes from Jacob, Israel. And so Joseph makes sure that Manasseh gets closer to his grandfather by his right hand. Why is that? Manasseh is the firstborn, and he will receive a double portion, and he will receive a special blessing. That's why he needs to be by the right hand of his grandfather. Ephraim, is the younger. He's just there. Just to be there. He doesn't receive anything special. And I think if he would ask his dad the question, Dad, but why not me? You know, I, I, I'm just, I want to be, you know, it needs to be fair. Uh, why not me? What would Joseph say? I'm sorry, boy, but you were not born at the right time. You were born wrong, actually. As I read that story, I'm thinking about me, and I'm thinking about us. Weren't we all born wrong? We don't deserve to sit on those thrones. We don't deserve to be there in inheritance of heaven. We don't deserve to be in the Eden restored because we are born to sin in sin and we are born carnal. That's how we are born. Regardless of how much things, how many things we want to do, even good things, we can change our nature, who we are. We are born in sin. Can the leper change its spots? So Ephraim 
You just stand here. There is no special blessing for you. Just, just be here, you know. And as Jacob is getting ready to, to bless his grandchildren, and he is, he is almost blind, and his hands are coming down, what is happening? His hands are coming down, and he is crossing his hands. And Joseph, that was preparing for this moment of solemnity and special blessing, he's thinking, oh my, <laughs> my, dad, my dad is more blind than I realized. He doesn't really see, you know, what is happening. And what is he doing? This is wrong. This is not Right, what is he doing? Manasseh is the firstborn. He needs to be by the right side and receive the, a special blessing and inheritance. Ephraim doesn't deserve this. And Jacob crosses his arms. I'm not quite familiar with the, with the culture of that time, but I just think that to try to fix what the father does at such a moment of solemnity would be very inappropriate. And this is what Joseph does. Look at the picture. He grabs the hand of his father and he says, Dad, not so. Ephraim doesn't deserve your right hand. Let me move your hand and put it where it belongs. It has to be on Manasseh. That's how things should look. That's who deserves your blessing. He is the firstborn. And what was father's reply? I know. Jacob says, I know. I'm not that blind. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. When I think about this story, I think of another time, a thousand years down the road, when the Heavenly Father crossed His arms on the cross of Calvary. On His precious, only begotten Son, the deserving Son, the son who deserves all heaven and everything. Heavenly Father crosses his arms and places wrath, condemnation, your sin and my sin on his precious son, Jesus. Just that you and I can receive inheritance and blessing that we don't deserve. As I, as I thought about it and prayed about it, I thought, why would Jacob do that? Was he firstborn or a secondborn? Born? Second. Did he receive the blessing? I will not let you go, he said, on that night. Until you do what? Until you bless me. He wanted to, to have the blessing by all means, and he received that blessing. An undeserving. His name, Jacob, means a cheater and traitor. The one who turned away from God so many times, but the Lord placed his blessing on him. And God provided that illustration for you and me in the scripture so we would see that sometime later, that's exactly what Jesus will accomplish. He will become the one who will take your sin and my sin so that you and I can be seated in heaven. That's the gospel. There is no amount of good works that we can do to, to deserve heaven. It's only by initiative and the blessing and, and the salvation that comes from the Lord. It was Jesus who said, 
Lord, let this cup pass by me, but may not be my will, but your will. I am willing. If you choose to cross your hands, I'm, I'll take it. I'll take the place of a person living in 21st century, struggling in this area or other area. I'll be representing them in the judgment of heaven. And I'll tell the whole universe and the accuser of the brethren, my blood, my blood, my blood. I am standing here for this person. That's the only way we can deserve the salvation. Yes, we stole the silverware over and over again. But because Jesus died on the cross, he can say, he is forgiven, he is free, he is covered. Case is dismissed. Because I have taken his place and I'm giving him a second chance. You know, we can, we can study many more details about millennium and judgment and events that are happening in the beginning and the end. But one thing I want you to remember, that when the enemy comes to you and he wants to tell you that not so, you don't deserve anything. Your marriage cannot be saved, cannot be restored. God says, yes, it can. My grace is sufficient from you, for you. If the enemy comes and he says, not so, you will not make through this storm. This storm is too big for you. You're going to get crushed through this storm. God comes and he says, you will make through this storm. Because I will be with you in this storm and I'll lead you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the message we need for today. Because God will lead his people like you and me to the great day when there will be no more sorrow, no more death, just because there was a time when his hands were crossed on the hill of Calvary and he laid the things that you and I deserve on his son. See, we, we, we grow up with the idea that you get what you deserve, don't we? That's the idea we grow up with. It. It's in our mind. You get what you deserve, the performance-based society. But when it comes to the gospel, if you surrender your life to Jesus and come to him with all of your heart and give it to him, you get what Jesus deserves. That's the gospel. I think you didn't hear it. If you surrender your life to Christ, you get what He deserves. Amen. This is the gospel. Glad and merry tidings that makes man hard sing with joy. There is no other gospel. That's why Jacob said, I know, I know. But this is how God redeems his undeserving children. One day, there will be a day when you and I will cast our crowns to the feet of Jesus because there is no other gospel. If we are there, when we are there, it will be always because of what he has done for us. There is only one way to be saved is to embrace the love of God. Receive the Son. And to those who have received him, he gave a power. Thank you, Ryan, for that scripture. To become the children of God. Even those who believe in his name. Eden is for you. Have you surrendered your life to Christ?
2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And how we get there? It is by surrendering to Jesus and choosing him to be first and best and last in your life and mine. Have you made that commitment, friend? If not, I pray that you will make it today. You don't have to wait. Will you please pray and ask the Lord to enter your heart even today? Choose Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. There is no more important message. There is no better gospel anywhere in the world. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Because for those who have accepted Him, He has prepared Eden. From Eden to Eden. Eden lost and Eden restored. Revelation 21, 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned to her husband. Question. A checkpoint. At the end of the millennium, the redeemed have been with Christ for the whole thousand years. And John says, I saw the city coming down from heaven. Question to you. Why is he calling the city a bride? Test question. Any suggestions? Is he talking, let me give you some guides. Is he talking about the walls or the streets or the architecture, the bridges and fountains and uh, rivers? And what is he talking about? Why is he calling the city a Bride, help me. Because it is his people, absolutely. You and I are in that city. They're coming down from heaven. At the end of the millennium, and this earth is cleansed and purified, and it's being recreated before our very eyes. God will go through the same process of creation by recreating the world to its original beauty. But the word bride is my favorite word in this scripture. Because in that word, you and I are included. And you and I can be there if we Follow Christ and surrender to Him and choose Him daily to be our Lord and Savior. That old spiritual says, when the saints are marching in, I want to be in that number. How about you? I want to be in that number. In order to be in that number, you have to make the decision today. There is no better time. When you hear the gospel of Christ, open your heart. Receive Christ by praying a simple prayer with me. Would you like to stand for that prayer? Let's stand. Lord, you know me. You know that I am a sinner. Lord, I pray that your precious blood cleanses me, and washes away my sin. Thank you for the forgiveness and grace. Thank you for calling me your child. Help me to trust in you every day. And thank you for the hope of eternal life and the new home that is being prepared for me. I pray that by God's grace, none of us would be missing on that beautiful day of reunion and celebration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.